Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. The U.S. imprisons a higher portion of its population than any country in the world. The so-called prison industrial complex is for many towns in rural America a driving force for its economy. At the same time, many of these prisons have been turned over to private companies, like Prison Corporation of America, to be run as cheaply and profitably as possible, regardless of the damage inflicted on inmates. The result, in fact, the necessity, is the dehumanization of prisoners and subsequently the gradual dehumanization of those that work in these places. Shane Bauer, a senior reporter for Mother Jones, went inside as a $9 an hour guard to see firsthand what was happening inside the Winfield, Louisiana prison. His magazine story gained national attention and has now become a book, American Prison, a reporter's undercover journey into the business of punishment. It is my pleasure to welcome Shane Bauer back to this program. Shane, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Given your history, and you can tell our listeners a little bit about your experience in Iran, one would argue that you didn't want to go anywhere near prisons for the rest of your life. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, Yeah, I spent uh, two years uh, in prison in Iran uh, after being detained on the Iran-Iraq border with two uh, others. Um, Our situation became a, a political situation. We were kind of pawns between uh, Iran was trying to use as, as leverage um, with the United States. Uh, after I was released, I, you know, I assumed that eventually I would go back to the Middle East. Uh, the Arab Spring was well underway. That is, the Middle East is, was the focus of my uh, reporting. Uh, but I, when I came home to California, there was a, a massive hunger strike taking place in prison. Uh, there were reports of 30,000 uh, inmates uh, on hunger strike protesting the use of long-term solitary confinement. Um, I had been in solitary confinement myself. I uh, know the torture of, of solitary confinement, and uh, I had also been in hunger strike. And so I was kind of naturally drawn to this. Uh, and when I was ready to jump back into my work, I dove deep into um, the subject of solitary confinement uh, in the United States. I found that we have 80,000 people in solitary on a given day. Uh, we in California have uh, 10 uh, people that are in solitary for 10, 20, 30, and 40 years, uh, thousands of people. Um, you know, so I kind of really got deep into this. And, and after that, was just drawn further uh, into the issue of uh, imprisonment in America um, certainly motivated by my own experience uh, in prison. And it was hard for me to, you know, to turn away from the fact that in this country, we have a quarter of the world's prison population. Um, And I I spent a a few years kind of reporting on prisons and criminal justice and was uh, constantly frustrated at the uh, lack of access that we have to prisons in this country. Um, And uh, this, this lack of access is, is especially strong in uh, private prisons Um, and I wanted to see you know we know very little about uh, what life is like in these prisons um, and I wanted to get an up close look so I had the idea of of applying um, for a job and to be honest I didn't think it was going to work you know I just uh, filled out the application I I, I didn't lie in my application Um, I put down my job history including my uh, employment um, at Mother Jones and uh, Within a couple of weeks, I was getting phone calls for job interviews, um, and I uh, ultimately took a job for nine dollars an hour at a uh, Wind Correctional Center in Louisiana. When you went in there, how surprised were you initially with respect to the conditions that you found? Um, I, you know, I had a sense that uh, some of the problems with private prisons, but I was surprised uh, at just the kind of utter chaos and almost amateurish way that the prison was run. Um, it was just really a bare bones operation. Um, there were, you know, 1500 prisoners and oftentimes 24, 25 guards on a shift. Uh, the, uh, medical situation was really shockingly appalling. Um, one of my first days inside the prison, I met a man who had lost his leg and fingers to gangrene. Uh, he had, begged for months for uh, to be sent to a doctor outside of the prison. Um, 
and would was just given Motrin and you know sent back to his uh, to his unit. Um, the fact is that you know the prison, if if the the company, if they sent somebody to the prison, they would have to foot the bill. So they're very reluctant uh, to provide uh, that kind of medical care to to prisoners. Uh, there were um, you know guard towers in the prison, but uh, the the towers were empty. The prison cut you know took the guards from the towers to save money. It was really manifest in in every aspect of the prison and. It resulted in a prison that was um, very violent. Uh, there were, in four months, there were some 200 weapons found in the prison. Uh, this is far higher than, than any other prison in Louisiana. Um, and, you know, it was a really toxic place to work. And uh, it was so, so intense, the experience of being there, that I really saw myself uh, changing uh, quite dramatically. Um, I became uh, very kind of authoritarian, uh, was just, you know, day after day, just trying to figure out how to kind of get through the day um, in this uh, situation where, you know, I was in a unit with 350 prisoners and just one other guard and we had no weapons. To what extent did you find that coming back to the, the first subject you talked about in terms of solitary, was there a, a, a nexus between more solitary confinement and private prisons? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, solitary confinement, and especially long-term solitary confinement, is uh, you, typically used in the highest security prisons we have. They're called supermax prisons. And private prison companies uh, generally run prisons that are low and medium security. So uh, it was used in the prison uh, that I was in. In fact, it was used so much that the unit, uh, there was actually very few people in solitary confinement because uh, they would be double celled uh, because the, you know, the, the unit was, was always packed with people. Um, but it wasn't for the kind of years long, um, you know, type of solitary confinement that you see in the higher security public prisons. Talk a little bit about the ways in which you started to see yourself change. You, you talk in the book about even some of the prisoners talked about the fact that they had seen you change. Yeah. I mean, when I went in, I really, uh, you know, I had the idea that I would just be kind of, um, you know, easygoing guard. I would treat people humanely and I would be fine. Um, but, you know, I started to, one, realize very quickly that it was literally impossible to do the job that I was meant to do. And it was utterly exhausting uh, working 12 hours a day that prisoners were, even though they would say to, to us guards that, you know, they understood that we were not responsible, uh, that we couldn't change the kind of bigger management problems in the prison and would even uh, kind of bond uh, with guards over their shared disdain for the company. You know, they would still be frustrated on a daily basis by the fact that their classes were getting cut, that they weren't getting recreation time, that there, you know, uh, there was always some issue uh, that drew from the fact that there just weren't, wasn't enough staff in the prison. So, you know, uh, I would be dealing with that frustration and uh, was often being threatened. Uh, and I realized pretty early on that, uh, you know, I, any kind of sense of uh, guilt that I had or responsibility to, to you know, treat people uh, the way that, you know, I might treat somebody on the outside I had to, to really dispel of that, and I had to turn off that part of myself um, if I was going to be doing this job. And once I did that, it became a lot easier. Um, and But as a result, I became, you know, much more authoritarian, much more kind of cold, uh, and was just uh, almost, at times almost obsessed with my uh, the kind of daily battles that I had with uh, prisoners and was putting less and less energy over time into uh, actually reporting in the prison. If that was happening to you that came to this in a very different way, talk about how you saw it transforming the other guards that were there because that was what they had to do. Yeah, I mean, my situation was very different from theirs. They, uh, you know, were typically driven to the job out of desperation. You know, they're poor people from a town where the average family makes $25,000 a year. Some were uh, single moms who just, um, you know, needed health insurance for their children. Um, 
and the you know for them to to leave the job was a much more difficult decision than it was for me um and you know i would say that uh, i don't nobody who i met i think took the job because out of some kind of sadistic motive uh but i would also see see them change and see them uh kind of uh become um hardened by by the job and when you see the people that have worked there for years um you know they uh would just sometimes just snap you know and this was very common seeing guards just kind of lose control uh and uh alcoholism is very common um uh and in general for for prison guards uh the rate of PTSD that prison guards have is is higher than soldiers uh you know who returned from from Iraq Talk a little bit about the history of prisons, particularly in the South and private prisons in the South, because that's a, a big part of what you talk about, that the history is an important part of what's happening today. Yeah, I mean, for m- most of American history, the history of American prisons is a history of for-profit prisons. Uh, American prisons up until, you know, the 1970s, uh, especially in the South, were meant to uh, to turn a profit. The very first prison in America at the end of the 18th century was meant to turn a profit through prison labor. Um, and in the South in particular, uh, this, uh, especially after the Civil War, um, the, the prison systems were all privatized in the South. Um, prisoners would be sent to labor camps uh, run by private companies or uh, plantations. And they essentially, you know, filled the role uh, that slaves had occupied. They were forced to labor. Uh, people who didn't make quotas were tortured. They were whipped. Um, and the, uh, the the death rate of uh, prisoners in, under this system of convict leasing was actually higher, much higher than the death rate under slavery. Um, depending on the state, the averages range from 16 to 25 percent a year. Uh, this is uh, roughly the equivalent of the death rate of the Soviet gulags. Uh, and, you know, we're talking, some of these are major companies, like the U.S. Steel Company, the first billion-dollar company in the world, was using prisoners as slave labor. Um, and this, you know, this system evolved eventually to where states uh, were decided, you know, they were, the states were also profiting from this convict leasing system. Uh, Alabama made 10 percent of its state budget from uh, convict leasing. But eventually the states decided essentially to cut out the middleman. They bought plantations of their own, ran them at a profit, uh, you know, that would all the profits go directly to the state. And it was this system that um, the co-founder of CCA started his career in. Uh, Terrell Don Hutto in 1967 ran a cotton prison plantation where prisoners picked cotton in a plantation the size of Manhattan. Uh, You know, all of the prisoners were forced to labor in the fields. Uh, He lived on a plantation with his family. They had uh, houseboys that served them. Um, You know, he lived a life that was uh, very reminiscent of uh, a life before the Civil War uh, of a slave owner. And he, he would go on to run uh, plantation prisons in Arkansas uh, at a profit to the state. And he eventually attracted the attention of a couple of businessmen who, you know, proposed to him the idea of starting a corporation um, that uh, became the the Corrections Corporation of America. How much is race still an issue with respect to what goes on in these prisons today? Well, race is an issue throughout the uh, criminal justice system. I mean, the majority of uh, Prisoners are, are African American. Uh, in the prison that I was in, it was about 75% black. Um, the, the, you know, the, the rate at which uh, African Americans are in prison is much higher than uh, than it is for white people. Um, but I would say that this uh, problem uh, is today more of a result of uh, it's you know prisons are determining this. This is this fact is of the racial disparity is. Uh, has to do with courts. It has to do with policing. Um, it you know has to do with racism in all aspects of the criminal justice system. And prison is really just the end of the line. 
Talk a little bit about the, the private prisons, Corrections Corporation. They changed their name to try and be friendlier, I suppose. I'm not really clear why. And how they're perceived today, as you see it. Yeah, the uh, the company, after I published uh, my article in Mother Jones, they uh, changed their name to Core Civic. Uh, they now call themselves a government solutions company, mm-hmm. although they they do exactly the same work that they did when they were called TCA. They you know, run private prisons. Um, I think the perception uh, of this company and other private prison companies like the Geo Group uh, is not good. You know, I, I think that private prisons are, are quite unpopular. Um, I never really meet anybody who uh, says they think private prisons are a good idea, including people in the in the prison, um, uh, you know, uh, have their careers in prisons or in uh, in uh, criminal justice. Um, and they still manage to survive because uh, states, you know, want to save money. Uh, so they hang on to them. Um, but, you know, there have been uh, efforts to end them, including uh, the Obama administration uh, at, at the end of the Obama presidency announcing they were going to stop using uh, private prisons. Um, when, when this announcement was made, the stock price of the company fell in half. Um, but, you know, the Trump presidency essentially saved them and they are now uh, doing better than they were uh, before that decision. Are, is it a growing business now? Are they expanding at this point? Uh, they are expanding. Uh, most of the expansion now uh, is in the realm of immigrant detention. Uh, while the private prison companies run uh, control about 8% of the national prison population, they control about two-thirds of the uh, population of uh, immigrants in detention. Um, when uh, During the height of the, uh, the child separation crisis, the stock price of uh, CCA jumped 14%. Um, and and when, when the day that Trump was elected, the stock price of CCA rose more than any company in the stock market. And I think that had a lot to do with uh, expectations of, uh, you know, stricter immigration uh, policies under Donald Trump. What did you see in terms of, of the state of the prisoners when they got out of these kind of prisons, the recidivism rate, etc.? cetera? Um, I don't know... Uh, the difference, you know, I don't have data on the recidivism rate, uh, particularly from private prisons. Um, so I can't comment on that. And I, I also didn't see, I met one prisoner uh, who I knew from inside who got out and he is now back. Um, but, you know, generally the, these prisons, I mean, in reality, Prisons throughout America, whether public or private, uh, have very little uh, to offer in terms of uh, rehabilitation. But uh, private prisons have even less, you know, than public prisons. Um, this is this fact is borne out by Department of Justice studies and you know my own experience at Win. Um, so there's there's really not much uh, that's being done inside of these places that uh, would lead to um, you know somebody being uh, what we consider rehabilitated. And what have you seen in terms of the damage done to prisoners? These places are, are very violent. Um, you know, the, I saw people getting stabbed in front of me. Um, the rate of violence was higher than any prison in Louisiana. Um, there's very little security. Uh, you know, so the prisoner's kind of day-to-day life is really, a lot of it is spent um, on figuring out how to be safe. And it this creates a, you know, it leads to a spiral of violence where I met prisoners who said, you know, that they have carried knives in prison uh, just, you know, as a matter of protection. Um, in the four months that that I was there, uh, there were 200 weapons found in the prison. This was uh, 23 times more than uh, the number of weapons found at the state's maximum security prison at the same time period. What, if any, lawsuits have been brought against the state of conditions in these private prisons? Uh, there are constantly lawsuits um, against uh, these companies uh, brought by prisoners. Um, there was um, uh, a man that I uh, met who had uh, lost his legs to gangrene who was suing the company. Uh, there you know, were lawsuits claiming that uh, the you know, the conditions were uh, unsafe, 
um, or unhealthy because of lack of staffing. Um, you know, these, these are common throughout the country, uh, hundreds of lawsuits at a given time. And finally, what is your prognosis for these private prisons, that they'll continue to grow, that there's really nothing that, that, that's pushing back against them at this point? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I would not say that there's nothing pushing back against them. Uh, there has been a growing uh, uh, movement against um, these prisons and for criminal justice uh, reform generally. Um, there are have been divestment campaigns that have been successful. Uh, I mentioned the uh, uh, federal government even uh, trying to, to stop uh, private prisons. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's not a huge indication that states are turning away from them. Um, but what is clear is that uh, they're unpopular um, and they there really is uh, very little reason for these prisons to exist. Their a recent Department of Justice study said that the cost savings of these prisons are negligible. That is the only reason that, that anybody is, is using these prisons is, is uh, to save money. Shane Bauer, his new book is American Prison, a reporter's undercover journey into the business of punishment. Shane, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you.